welcome to Cape Town, the Tavern of the Seas, here in South Africa, where the second leg of the 2014-15 Volvo Ocean Race is about to begin. The Cape Town dockside has attracted the crowds, and while the Volvo Boatyard has been servicing the fleet, the sailors have been regrouping, restoring physical and mental reserves, and soaking up the warmth of the city. And today it's windy. As the seven boats sat in the dock this morning, the weather teams were downloading weather files that predict strong upwind conditions for the next three days as the sailors fight to get acclimatized to the next four weeks at sea. 6,125 miles lie ahead. And as the sailors left the dock a few hours ago, they knew this would be a tough test for them and their racing machines. Joining me for the race today is Olympic medalist Mark Cavell. Mark, oh, always a clash of emotions with the excitement of starting the race and that bitter sting of leaving family and friends behind. You, you've been a competitor in this race before. As each leg gets completed, does it get any easier to leave the dock? No, it certainly doesn't. It's it's a very difficult time because this is the transition also between you know land lover to sailor again. You know you've got to you've got to start saying goodbye to people, saying goodbye to amazing places, amazing restaurants, great food, wonderful hospitality, and get on with the sailing, and then you're off. Now obviously Cape Town has featured in this uh, Volvo Ocean Race and the Whitbread Round the World Race since almost since its inception. It holds a very special place in the sailor's heart, doesn't it? Well, geographically, it's an amazing place to sail into and an obvious place to stop over, and the hospitality is second to none. Now, as with all the offshore races, the challenge starts with an intense short course set just out from the harbour. Overall, it's going to be a real slog to Abu Dhabi in the UAE, 6,125 miles. Let's have a closer look. First challenge for the Volvo fleet is the evening start from Cape Town, which means trying to make it smartly through the wind shadow of Table Mountain and changing gear as that roaring wind kicks back in from the south. All played out as day here turns to night. Then the pressure turns from boat preservation to picking the right track, focus on the navigators as they head north towards the equator, through the Straits of Hormuz and into Abu Dhabi and the finish line. Seven teams are competing this year, all the crews trying their best to win, and at the head of each team is one sailor, the skipper. Let's take a look at the lineup. Charles Cordrelier, he's shown that he can push the boat hard, finish second in leg one. Sam Davies, skipper of team SCA, the first all women team in over a decade. Bauer Becking, third into Cape Town, he'll be happy to repeat that performance. Charlie Enright, he founded this young team in 2011 with the goal of beating the veterans of the race. Ian Walker, first into Cape Town. He's got a target on his back and he's looking for another good finish into his home port of Abu Dhabi. Chris Nicholson of Team Vestas Wind, a late entry without much training time, but a confidence building fourth in the last leg. Nico Martinez, he's made some crucial crew changes and he needs to prove the new team. Well, as we've said, there's plenty of breeze out on the water at the moment. It, in fact, I mean, as we were looking on the water, Mark, we, we were wondering if it was dropping. And now, as we see Sam Davies and Team SEA roaring across the middle of the screen, I mean, maybe it's even got up. I mean, perhaps we're going to see this this race held in 30 knots. Well, we were watching the, uh, the dock out and uh, saw wonderful scenes as they came out. And then they poked their, their heads out into Table Bay and the breeze was right up over 30 knots and they've come back inside for a while but now they've they've got mains up it looks like one reef and they're out and it's very very gusty it's very similar to the uh, the import race where we see these breeze coming round to the east of table mountain you can see the breeze up there it really is an amazing view and look at the breeze coming over the top that that cloud is often called the uh, the tablecloth on top of the table mountain there's the cable car uh, building at the top there, incredible views down there. Now, of course, this is just the start of this mammoth leg all the way to the Arabian Sea and uh, Abu Dhabi. But first of all, we've got uh, an hour or so racing in Table Bay, right off the city shoreline of Cape Town. And with the import race that we saw only a few days ago, one of the big factors that seemed to play out 
was sail selection. And as you've already noted, with this breeze, we had a, a, a reefed uh, main on some of the boats. It will be a big, uh, a big chance to see what are going to be the sail combinations that we're going to see now. Uh, we we did uh, we ha have been hearing about something that was happening on the water a little earlier, a little bit of a surprise for for one of the boats. In fact, uh, we can just see it now on the screen. This has only just come in, but apparently, what what's happened is Team Vestas, uh, a huge. Uh, manufacturer of wind turbines in fact the world leader one of their big things that they're doing this year for the race mark is it's all about a race we can win yes they're here to support the sailors yes they're here to get these sailors around the world in the best shape possible but also they're really trying to spread this message about ecological energy sources and uh, earlier on out in the water I mean we've only just seen this footage but earlier on the uh, the crew were surprised by uh, by a boat showing up right in the middle of their training ground with a choir of, uh, uh, of uh, young singers from Cape Town uh, are basically just trying to remind the sailors about what the real message is out there today. And it's, it is about the Volvo Ocean Race, but of course, you know, on a platform like this, Vesta's so keen to remind everybody that there's a larger race at stake. Well, I've seen some flash mobs in, the, in my time, but I've never seen a flash mob in the middle of, 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 uh, of Table Bay. <laughs> Well, that's a really nice little touch for the guys on board Vestas and a, a nice way to start. So the countdown has begun. We've got two minutes 30 to go for the start line. Shortly, we'll see these. Uh, shortly, we're going to see these uh, these boats getting near to the start line. Let's have a little bit of a look at the course in a little bit more detail that we're going to be sailing today. So in winds gusting over 30 knots, they'll cross that start line here. The white line just on the right of screen up to mark one. Round that, leave it to port, bear away, down, cross the beach side, round mark two. Oncoming traffic as they come back up to mark three, bear away, back round mark four, and on to the last mark of the course here, mark five, the leaving mark, and on to the Cape of Good Hope and Abu Dhabi beyond. So the countdown's uh, closing down towards the start. Let's just take a few minutes to uh, bring in our on the water commentators. We've got Alan Block, sailing journalist from Sailing Anarchy, out on the water. Uh, Alan, how does the breeze look at the moment? <laughs> Skip, uh, uh, we like to say it's blowing the dogs off the chains. And uh, I think there's a chance it might be blowing the lions off the chains down here in South Africa. Uh, we're looking at Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing. Ian Walker going for a second reef, the, uh, a significantly smaller amount of mainsail than the other boats. And, and, and it remains to be seen whether some of the other boats take that reef. It's a real pleasure to be here with Skip Novak, one of the most traveled men in the world in big, big storms. And Skip, I wonder uh, uh, for a guy like you that's set off into countless storms in the Antarctic and Antarctic uh, Circle, what are these guys thinking as they head into the storm? Well, I mean, uh, it's an uh, you know, inauspicious start, uh, starting very late. And, uh, but I'd have to tell you, I'm envious. I wish I was with him. Well, we're into the final closing moments of the start line. The start on the left-hand side of your screen, you've got the white square pin mark boy. Above that, towards the middle of your screen, there's a large gray committee boat. That line is the line that the boats are allowed to cross once the countdown reaches zero. And the breeze is not squaring this line up. It's a slight reach into the line, which is gonna make it very difficult for these boats to hit that line perfectly on time. So it's Cape Town, South Africa for the start of leg two. Big breeze for the start, and Maffrey looks set to get a really nice lead off the start at the pin end. Now they're in the wind shadow of Table Mountain at the moment. The, the teams with their J2s up, so obviously expecting a little bit more breeze. Uh, Alan, uh, where you are with uh, your eyes down on the water, we're looking at some boats being left behind. Abu Dhabi and uh, Vestas being left behind in light breeze. And Brunel up the top of the course just managing to find a, a little patch of breeze. Is it as patchy as it looks to us? Niles, it's, it's about to not be that patchy. Right now, where they are, we're directly in the shadow of the mountain. And that means that it's like you're, being, you're, in, you're in a calm uh, uh, ocean with tiny little puffs. 
and I'm, I'm literally, it was about five knots of breeze here a second ago, and I'm just, just got a big puff on the course, easily 20 knots, and you can see some of these boats start to light up. So again, these guys taking care of their boats, not, not beating their boats up to, 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 be, to jump on the line um, because they know that wind is coming, and uh, you really, you gotta save yourself a little bit so you have enough to get through, oh, the next 28 days or so. Well, everybody's been setting themselves up for a very heavy wind start. And Abu Dhabi investors just, in fact, left off the line, almost parked up with no breeze. Uh, Mark, clearly these sailors have decided they're going to set themselves up for the gust. Well, they certainly have. And you can see top left of screen now, Brunel just coming into that gust as it fans out and hits uh, SCA on the bow. And you can see them start to light up now. And here comes the, uh, the, the, the conditions that they're expecting. And it really is, must be so difficult to start in that light condition, uh, knowing that you're, you're, you're actually set for the, for the bigger breeze that you're going to come into as you go left and out onto those uh, big plains as the water sneaks round Table Mountain. And look at the breeze here on Mapri now. So as you can see, it's a fetch to Mark 1. It's not a perfect beat. And these boats have set up for the bigger breeze that they are all about to hit. Team Brunel on the top of Mafre out towards Mark 1, but it's Abu Dhabi and Vestas, Chris Nicholson and Ian Walker, those two boats yeah. electing to start at the pin end of the line and struggling to find the breeze. Maybe they just thought that the wind shadow down at the bottom of the line would just be a little bit softer down there, but Brunel and Bao Becking seven times he's done the Volvo Ocean Race, or this will be his seventh. He's picked his starting line perfectly. Team SCA just underneath them, very tough conditions. That start looked almost sedentary, and now they're going to be out on this course. We could be seeing 30 knots out there, Mark. I mean, what is it like to try and maneuver this boat around this tight course? These boats are built for long, open oceans. Well, it is tricky. It is tricky because there's uh, not enough people on board for these very, very close conditions, but only a few minutes ago they were sat around almost like mill pond conditions and now look Ica Martinez on the helm there hunched down holding the wheel hard and he's got Brunel breathing down his neck on uh, the windward side and you can really see the breeze starting to build and, uh, and come down like uh, almost like little little helicopter puffs as they push down over the fleet. Now this is the race to watch at the moment Mafre and Brunel bow to bow towards Mark 1. Brunel on top, gonna get those gusts a little bit earlier, but Mafre with that slightly tighter to the breeze course, maybe a little bit more power, maybe they're gonna be able to keep their bow ahead. Just behind them, the battle for second and third place, we've got Alvi Medica and Team SCA. Now, really nice to see, Mark. We've got Mafre vying for the lead. This is a team that's made some big changes with their lineup going into today. They, didn't have a fantastic race on the on the last leg. In fact, they were pipped right at the finish line by Sam Davies. And Ica Martinez just moved all the pieces on off the board and almost rebuilt his team from scratch. We've had some, some major sailors going out and some big names coming back in. So this will be a very interesting boat to watch. As you were saying earlier, he needs to see the proof in the pudding. Have they made the right decisions? It must have been a incredibly difficult decision to remove some of these fantastic sailors off the boat. Well, it's always difficult to move the teams around, but it's, uh, sometimes a change is better than uh, uh, you know, to make the changes, uh, you know, that. So here we've got Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing still at the back of the fleet, chasing Team Vestas win. Ahead of them, a pack of five, almost starting to make a little bit of a breakaway, just starting to get a little bit comfortable at the front, but still at the front. Team Brunel not allowing Mafre to get their bow clear. It's going to be a big moment when we get to Mark 1. Team Brunel has to start putting the bow down, has to start bearing off. Mafre already on that slightly lower course. So here we go at Mark 1 Cape Town. It's the beginning of leg two, and Mafre, with a fantastic start at the pin end, leads the fleet around the first mark. Team Brunel tight on their heels, just slotting into that windward quarter position. These two are gonna be locked into a battle right to the next mark. Alan, this is looking to be a race really being fought between these two boats. Which one do you think's got the slightly better position? Would you prefer to be the leeward or the windward in this situation? That's not what's important, Niles. What's important is I picked Mopfrey to win the import race. I was just about four days early. Uh, these guys are off to the races. They have absolutely pushed it. And I'll tell you what position I'd like to be in. I'd like to be in front, exactly where Iker Martinez is, making up for that tough first leg. 
making up for that bad import race and absolutely sending it. This is unbelievable, guys. I wish you were on the water with me. So fantastic to see these boats finally finding the power in their sails that they were setting up for on the start line. If, if, if you just tuned in at the start and you weren't aware of what the breeze was blowing, it would have almost looked like a crazy, crazy decision. But as you can see, Chris Nicholson on Team Vestas rips the boat away around Mark 1. He's got a little way to go to catch up. Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing behind him. But now you can see why they've elected to sails with that slightly less power. Reef in the main. A J2 up on the head sail, they're not using the full amount of power that these boats can produce. So now we're on the reach, out to Mark II. Mafre just flying away from the other boats out in the lead. Brunel hot on their heels. It's going to be very interesting to see at Mark II, the, the fleet have got to turn around, pull a 180 handbrake maneuver and fly back towards the previous mark they've gone around. Mark one. Team Brunel bow backing their mark, electing to come low inside Mafre, inside Ica Martinez, possibly trying to set up for a bit of a steal at the mark. Well, as these puffs come down the course, the uh, Brunel's really trying to push into the inside of uh, this mark rounding. And uh, you can see as they, the, as they were coming around that top mark, the fangs were blowing really to, to get the bows off and to get them going down, these, uh, down this leg. Uh, Alan, uh, where you are out on the water, how uh, easy are you finding it keeping up with these boats? I mean, they've got to be doing uh, upwards of 20 knots. That's, uh, that's a great question. Well, we'll come back to you, Alan, in just a moment. Hopefully you Probably haven't... Probably trying to chase them yeah, down. Yeah, you're not too far behind, but uh, still at the front, we've got Brunel, we've got Mafre. Look, Alfie Fang's Medigan. gone on uh, Dong Fong there. You've, Dong uh, Fong really are in trouble. You're absolutely right there, Mark. I could see the main sheet. Just, really just releasing gone, that power. Just gone slack almost. I mean, I... I Fingers crossed they haven't had a, a breakage this early in, uh, in leg two. Alvi Medica in third, Team Brunel looking a little bit more solid now in second. Mafre definitely claiming that lead. Still out towards the back, we've got Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing. We're just waiting for them to pouch. Dong Fong now, mains in, boats trucking along. The bow is up, the power that these boats produce. Uh, Alan, can you, uh, can you hear me out in the water? We're just wondering uh, you know, how, uh, how hard are these sailors having to hang on to these boats? They look like they're flying on these reaches. So Dong Fong at the moment, just flying through the waves there. Oh my word, the bow going in. Mark, you've been oh, on board are, these, these kind are great of boats. Shots. You know, how difficult is it to hang on? In fact, we can see the bowman on board Dong Fong getting swung to the leeward side. Yeah, they, I mean, they, you've got to remember they, they're not in full ocean race configurement. So the, the bow is down. They haven't got, uh, they probably haven't got the aft uh, tanks full um, of the water to keep the bow up. And uh, this is why the bow is so heavy. And look at all this water coming over the deck. And that's what we probably saw earlier when they released the bow, try to get the uh, get the boat back under under condition. There's not a lot of rudder in the boat, even though they've got two. They uh, the paired right down. These are real racing machines. Incredible images to see Dong Fong. That just goes to show you how hard they're pushing it. They are still trying to chase down the leading pair. Ika Martinez, Xavi Fernandez on board Mafre, and Bauer Becking on board Team Brunel. Bauer Becking now coming up onto the windward side of Mafre. I mean, which of these positions are they really going to stick with, Mark? Where do you want to be coming into this mark? Well, they're going to uh, round this mark to port, and uh, you can see the lured runner holding up on that uh, on, on, the, on the main there. And it's looking like uh, Matfrey's going to get that inside line. They're probably going to uh, come nice and wide, hold it wide, then uh, come down to a really controlled jive. They've got to get the main in, pinned, put the boat through the jive, then ease the main right off and then they'll bring it around the mark and uh, it looks looking like a pretty self ra uh, uh, safe rounding back uh, not too much uh, pressure on boats coming back at you we talked about the incoming traffic Alvi Medica deciding Mafre and Team Brunel I mean Mafre are obviously playing a, a defensive game here they've decided to push Bauer Becking up round over the mark here we go Alvi Medica deciding it's to come inside it's going to be inside. a big jive look at that now that is how you break things that, that you wanted to grind that main in. These full battens here, that was a that was a huge jive there on Matfrey there. I'm not sure if they wanted to do that. They still the haven't main been able was to get right that, out. They still haven't been able to get that main back out. They've still pinning it into the middle. Alvi Medica still to jive behind them. Alvi Medica trying to go for the steal here, trying to get the inside line on Team Brunel. Matfrey with an aggressive move. Sailing Bauer Becking past. Now we're in the trouble mark. here. Matfrey's got to get the new uh, the new sheet on. Yeah, you know, it's easy to think this, this, this is a huge mistake, but they just don't have the manpower. 
It looks like they've got the, the sheet coming on now. It is so hard. There's only eight sailors on this boat. This the is thing awesome. is 65 uh, feet long. You can see the pressure coming down. Look at uh, 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 Abu Dhabi coming in from behind and they just don't have the manpower to get the, uh, the, the sails in. It's incredible to see those three boats trying to turn tightly around that mark and just skinning wide. We've got Mafre still go. in front by the skin of their here. teeth. Team Vestas win. Chris Nicholson head sails away. They've elected to make it a little bit easier. Grind the main in. Team SEA and Sam Davis. Well, they're through the jibe, but Lovely can they move. control the power as it comes back up? The jib's good. Now, we saw earlier on, on board Mafre, they almost over-eased that jib on the jibe, and it wrapped around the front. Sam Davies and her team bringing the bow back up into that reach. Chris Nicholson on board, Team Vestas, sailing off downwind, away from the course, struggling to get back. Dong Fong with a late jibe there, really late jibe. Now, I mean, we could be being a little bit overly harsh, overly critical here, Mark, because, of course, one thing to remember is, yes, we've got this intense import action, but of course, this is the start of a massive race to Abu Dhabi and no one wants to break their boat at this stage. Absolutely. And they just, I keep saying that they just don't have enough manpower for these moves. It's a huge, you come screaming down the thing in sort of 30 knots and then you've got to do this massive turn. You've got to grind the main in. And uh, so we've got some kite sailors in front out enjoying the breeze, but unfortunately they've just got out in front of uh, Team Vestas and Chris Nicholson. Chris Nicholson really unable to turn his boat ar around uh, back up onto the reach. Uh, Alan, I wonder if, uh, if you can just give us a little bit of an insight of what we saw at that mark there from the water. How did it look? Niles, first of all, let me explain. We had to turn our microphone off because we had to do 26 knots just to keep up with these boats on t single and double reefs and tiny little jibs. So there was so much water coming over, we couldn't use the mic, but we're back. What you also didn't see up there is Dong Fong coming around the back didn't have a jive. What they did is a chicken jive, which is so much wind that they chose instead to tack um, and save uh, save that possibly batten breaking jive. Mafre, I'm sitting. I was looking at Mafre trying to see whether they they broke a batten because they really jived hard and that lured runner was on and and uh, it, it looked okay, but we won't really know. Maybe we'll try and get a look as they're going up wind. Uh, at the moment, though, guess who looks smart again? Ian Walker, Abu Dhabi Racing. I, I, I want to ask Skip. You know. You've, you've uh, sailed four of these races around the world. These boats are a little bit different. What's the biggest difference you're looking at now that you get to see them in all their glory? Well, a lot more white water coming over the deck for sure, but you gotta, yeah, you gotta head it to Ian Walker. I think he was quite wise putting that second reef in because the other boats are well overpowered with, that, uh, with their first reefs. So I keep an eye on him. So out in the lead, Mafre Ike Martinez still just ahead of Bauer Becking and Team Brunel, but Brunel not letting them get any extra distance, really not letting them get away. We're going to have a very, very tight race all the way out of Table Bay. Well, we should just recap on that uh, on that uh, second mark there. You know, they were they were screaming down, and what you're going to do to put a safe jibe here is to is to is, is to nail a nice long uh, turn, get the main in, grind the main in, get that under control. And then the helm just quickly takes, nudges the boat through, and you keep a little bit of sheet on the uh, the foresail, and that stops the the jib uh, running forward and wrapping around the forestay. You saw that was a very very close move there with Mapfrey, but the breeze got up just at the wrong time. There was a lot of pressure, boat on boat, and that's why you saw the wide turns and a little bit of carnage as uh, as they came round. But now they're all set and heading up to the next mile. And of course, you know one other factor in that tight jive, that 180 degree turn is these boats are built to be balanced by a swinging keel and also ballast tanks on either side of the boat that they can pump water in to try and balance out the immense power of the sails and going from uh, one direction, a 180 degree turn in the other, you've got to reverse all that riding moment to the other side of the boat and that takes time and that's something that the sailors just don't have in this close race. Now we can really see the breeze whipping across the screen, blowing all the boats right over on their sides. One thing all these crews have said, these boats are tippy. Yeah, they've got a little less stability than the old 70s, they're a very, very different boat. Uh, people that uh, come to them from the 70s, like Rob Greenhouch, who's uh, not really even uh, had, a, had, a, had a proper steer of these boats, um, really notice the differences. First of all, they lean over a little bit more. Secondly, the movement, the actual action in the boat is a lot more aggressive. Um, in the last uh, leg, uh, we had equipment that was strapped to a deck. It didn't, hang on a second, 
<laughs> okay. We've got a big change on uh, board uh, Vestas. Uh, Alan, when you're out in the water, can you see what uh, what Vestas is doing? It looks like a sail change. Yeah, you know, I, it's, it's, I tell you, now it's a little hard to tell. What we saw is we saw a furled sail coming unfurled. So I don't exactly know what, what, what happened. I, I think they went for a sail change and had a poor um, furl, but th we just saw them sailing off into the middle of nowhere, and now they're a good quarter mile behind the rest of the fleet. So certainly some drama. It looks like they got a hold, but Skip, did you see exactly what happened? Not exactly, but I think they may have a failure on the headsail because they uh, shot downwind uh, to protect the sail and dropped it right down to the deck. You know, we, we, we talked about this at length the other day, but these guys have to go some 8,000 miles or whatever it is, a long, long way. They have two days or three days of incredibly hard, nasty, boat-breaking conditions. And if they don't save these sails, they're not gonna make it to Abu Dhabi. And guess what? Three skippers chose not to take sewing machines on board to repair sails. Guess who was the first one to raise his hand when I asked? It was Chris Nicholson on Best as Wind. Let's see what happened to the sails or see if we can tell. We might not know for another, I don't know, 30 days. Well, are we just following the bow of Mafre at the moment? We can see they've got their J2 up. And of course, as Alan was saying before, you know, they've got to get these sails all the way round the world. And Mafre not electing to go for the J3, the slightly smaller, slightly safer sail that we can see on some of the other boats. In fact, just coming into your picture there, Alvi Medica sailing with the J3, a smaller sail, slightly less power. Mafre really being blown right over there. I mean, potentially this could be the wrong sail choice for that boat. Well, certainly on the, on the windy side now, you can see how much the boats heel over. And uh, they really need to keep that uh, the head cell on there because that's what's holding the bow down, stopping the boats round up. We've seen these boats round up before. We saw bow becking in the last race uh, round up as they ran the top mark. But really looking down the fleet, it looks like uh, uh, Abu Dhabi looks the most comfortable, but still plenty of breeze on board. Alan, how much breeze do you estimate there being on the course at the moment? Well, I'm not that smart, so I asked a guy much smarter than me who's been around the world a few times, and he said, I said, ask them 30 knots, what'd you say? I reckon it's 35, 35 on up. Yeah, and definitely some bigger puffs. So this is, uh, this is a full gale, boys and girls, and uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, I, I think, a pretty fitting start to a leg that began in a place that I haven't seen less than 20 knots in the last nine, nine days that I've been here. So what a place. It's certainly living up to its reputation. And Niall, do you believe that there are, I don't know, we counted about 200 boats out here that are braving these conditions? I mean, little tiny boats and fishing boats and ribs, and it's unbelievable. These Cape Tonians are the best. Well, they, they like a good yacht race, and they've uh, had a few come to uh, to their hometown. Um, I've got an interesting question. You're going to go around these top marks and the bear off, and then tell me, what is the wind shadow like at the next mark? Well, I think that's a question for the guy who lives right uh, underneath one of these mountains. Uh, Skip, what do you think? Yeah, they're going to probably lose a bit of breeze as they come inshore and cross into Granger Bay. That's the sh shadow table mountain. Right now, they're in the full force of the wind on the backside. Full force of the uh, Cape Doctor, what we call it. Cleans, it. cleans everything right out, blows it offshore. So we finish the reaches here on the import section of leg two. Mafre leading the fleet, now heading back down to cross the start line before beginning their way out into the sea. So yeah, they've got a bear down and they come now and they're gonna start to move to the next mark where you'll slowly start to lose a bit of pressure back to where the start line was. And uh, let's just see how big that uh, the, the, the lull behind the mountain really is. Nice bear away there from Alva Medica. I mean, is it just me or did Alva Medica just make up a little bit of a distance there on Team Brunel? They did go with the J3 and maybe a little bit less power, but they could control the boat a little more, drive it forward, and they've been able to claw down the distance. Ian Walker with Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing, he's done a fantastic job to get himself back up in contention for that early lead. Round the mark, looking very unflustered. This team, there's 20 Volvo Ocean Race campaigns combined on board that team. These guys, they're really not gonna be shocked by anything, are they? No, they really are, uh, con they are setting the conditions because what we've got to remember here, as soon as they go past the leaving mark, they start heading up the coast, and we can start thinking about that as they're, uh, you know, and they are start thinking about this as they, as they come round and start to move away from Table Bay. And we can start thinking and talking about uh, the, the conditions tonight. 
incredible breeze ripping down the course, but, a, but a, you know, in only a few moments, these teams are going to sail back into that wind shadow that we saw at the start line. So they're going to have to navigate their way back into that course. We could start seeing a few sail changes. A couple of the boats that went in, uh, across your picture just a moment ago already had the slightly larger sails up, ready to go. Sam Davies on board Team SEA, her team, already have the slightly larger J2 pulling them down into that wind shadow but we're going to be able to see the front runners slow up as Sam Davies and the rest of the fleet close up to them and try and overhaul them. It's really interesting to see the boats in this configuration. They've got to be round, racing around these marks. They're not really in uh, full offshore, offshore conditions. They haven't started stacking. The boats feel really bowed down. They're really pushing through these, these big flat water conditions. And we're seeing an overtake right here as Maffray just struggling to find a little bit of power, it looks like. Team Brunel managing to get, maybe not completely over the top of them, but certainly bow to bow. There's the next mark that they're he he heading for. It's where the start line was. Remember that wind shadow. Now with Team Brunel, it, it's still they look like they're just pouring over the top of Maffray. I wonder what slowed Maffray down so much. Even Alvi Medica now coming in over the top of them. So maybe Maffray just getting just getting the breeze taken out of their sails by Team Brunel. Well, I just had and a now note. Now Alvi Medica go over the top as well. I just had a note here that uh, from race committee that. Uh, the breeze is shifting from 120 to 160 and obviously going up and down quite considerably in pressure and you can see the, the shots that we saw just a second ago on it on board SCA and now it looks like a, a, a quiet stroll in the park on board uh, on Brunel here you can see the boat going uh, up upright now and the breeze is dropping so we're going to really start to see those those changing conditions as we come into that very, very, very tricky. And look, it looks like they've called a sail change. Here we go. So it'll be interesting to see what sail they're gonna go for here. It's, uh, it looks like it, it could be coming right off the end of the pole. So it could be one of their code zeros, could be the mask, their code zero, trying to find that little bit more power down towards that next mark. And Mafre have got a, a, got a, a bowman climbing the mast. So maybe a little bit of a problem at the top. In fact, clearly they've been trying to hoist their code zero, they've got it snagged at the top of the rig, and uh, in all the confusion, they've slipped a place. Now they're gonna have to send somebody up to the top to try and sort it out. You know, thank God this bowman, is, he's probably thinking, well, you know, I don't mind doing this now while the water's a little bit flatter. It would be hell going up that mast in the, in the wind and the waves that we just saw earlier. And here comes Alba Medica ready to take the steel on this next mark. And it is beautifully uh, flat conditions here, and you can just see this massive, great big wind lull. And they've got to keep the pressure on, keep the boats, boats ghosting through. We, in past races, we've had these crazy conditions and then absolute mill pond from behind Table Mountain. So we're a couple of boat lengths away from the next mark. Alan, it looks like a real park up at the front. Well, not only is it a park up, but it's a, a full bungee effect, right? With that wind shutting down. Now everyone is, has pulled right up to everyone else. Brunel made that pass, but now look, Mapre's overlapped to windward. Alva Medica overlapped to windward of them. Um, and, and you know what we were watching when Mapre was trying to figure out what was going on, it, it actually happened before that. They were they were trying to deal with, I don't, even, I don't know whether it was a halyard issue or what, but they were trying to deal with something and their trim was off for a while, for about a minute. And that's when Brunel, uh, who had perfect trim, while Mafre was spilling a lot of wind out of the top of their jib, Brunel was going fast, and that allowed them to make the pass. But look now, now, I mean, I, I tell you, this is kind of a good uh, uh, analogy for what we might see for the next 30 days. Uh, SCA now is coming right up, Dongfang over the top of Abu Dhabi, five boats overlapped at the mark, and SCA is coming, and they're gonna make six. Oh my God, guys, what do you see up there? Oh, this is just an incredible, incredible middle point for this race. Here we are at the pin mark of Cape Town, the start of leg two, and the entire fleet have ground to a halt, each one trying to drift over this mark. You've got Alba Madica and actually uh, just, it's about, it's like bowling balls just maintaining some momentum here. And, the, and on, on board Alba Medica, they're doing a really nice job now of calming it down and letting the boat just roll forward. You've got people coming through and now you've got Dong Fong starting to pick up the pressure and it's really going to be the, just the next little puff and it'll probably come for Dong Fong. Alan, uh, from where you are, how far have these boats got to drift to be able to get back into the breeze? You know, I mean, where we're looking, it looks like uh, with the direction they have to go to this mark, there's really no way out of it unless you make a really aggressive move. And I think with everyone doing what they're doing, 
Um, no one wants to lose anyone. The only one making an aggressive move right now, Sam Davies, and here she comes to Leward. I don't know if she'll be able to break through to Leward, but she's clearly trying something a little different than the rest of the fleet. Skip, is there a way to kind of get out of this? Well, not really. I mean, it's interesting that the mark was set right uh, smack dab downwind in the wind shadow. So uh, it's going to be very interesting to see what the, what they do. They're going to probably drive out, uh, split, and come back in at the mark at the other end. Um, this is a really aggressive move from Libby, Libby Greenhouse calling a jibe right out there. So a jibe at the mark. With now she's sailing actually away from the next mark. But it, it doesn't matter if everyone else is going four knots and she's going 12. She can just jibe back and then lay the next mark and be ways ahead. So now after... They've left uh, after leading the way. Guess who's following? Everyone else. Well done to the girls on SCA. And it looks like they're right on the edge of that uh, breeze envelope. Uh, clearly, Sam Davies and Libby Greenhow just thinking if they can just jive off and just, just move themselves forward almost in any direction, but just get into the next puff of breeze, they're going to be able to leave the rest of the fleet. Now, that was a very, very brave move from Sam Davies. We always talk about making these boats go faster and faster, but there's no way to make them slow down. And she had to be confident that there was going to be space for her boat at that mark. If she committed to that move and it went wrong, she'd have put a hole in another boat. So. Fair credit to the girls there. That was a very gutsy move. Now, we're seeing a code zero start to be unfurled on board uh, Dong Fong and potentially Matt Ray as well. Team SCA at the top of your picture. Look like they found a little bit of breeze. The bow comes down. The, the, the boat's moving. There's power in the sail. So fair credit to Sam Davies and Libby Greenhow. They played that one beautifully. Looks like they've just poked up into the conditions there and they've just started to got some breeze. It's coming from the right there and they are moving. Now, the tricky thing now is to stay in it. If uh, they, they sail out of it again, they'll be in trouble. And it seems to start to push away now. You can see that pressure going back up. And, the, and top right of picture there was Vestas coming back in. So SCA really trying to actually realize that they can't sail too low. They've got to stay up in the breeze. Like Alan was saying earlier, they've got to stay in something. And that they may do the big circle route down. And you can see uh, Vesta's coming in from behind, going to get around the mark. But everybody really trying to get up onto that right-hand pressure and then start to bear down in it. It's incredible how patchy this breeze is. And in fact, Alvi Medica on the left-hand side of your picture, they're just managing to find a little bit of pressure. And then it goes again. Mafray now with the pressure. Team SCA finding a little bit of breeze in their sails to push themselves forward. And now Brunel finds a little bit. But it's not about just finding a little puff. It's about making it stick. Now, as I watch these pictures, okay, the, the sails light, the boat's absolutely upright, searching for pressure. It is nothing like what's going to be going on at midnight tonight. They're going to come around this corner, get away from the wind shadow of, uh, of Table Mountain, and just look at these conditions compared to what they're going to be into. They're going to be going upwind in 20, 25, 30 knots, and it's going to be a very different look to this. A team SEA now with the breeze, the power's on, they're up already pulling around about 17 knots. The acceleration on these boats from almost stationary to uh, flat out, it's quite, quite uh, immediate. The code zero is up, pulling the boat forward. The girls obviously happy with the decisions they've made. They've made a very, very bold choice at that uh, leeward mark. We always comment about these with uh, Sam Davies and her, her team. They always make bold decisions, but behind them, Brunel, Mafre, and the rest of the fleet now finding the breeze and they're onto the chase. So Alan, out on the water, we're seeing these sailors. They they found the wind. Does it look solid from where you are? Uh, guys, it's um, yeah, guys. I I, what I want to tell you is that not only is the wind getting more solid, but uh, you, so there was some evolutions going on there as the big sails got hoisted. And I, I'll go back to Mafre, my my little favorite for the import, because. <laughs> they're the only ones who even thought about hoisting the masthead zero, the second biggest sail on the boat, a gigantic sail, and they put it up, and guess what? They let the whole fleet pass them while they were trying to get the thing up, as you guys saw, and they're, they've just left them like they're standing still. They're about, they just overhauled Alba Medica and went over the top, and they're catching uh, SCA at a rate of knots, and, and Skip, I mean, that's a big, tough sail made of some pretty crazy materials. Can that kind of thing handle this weather? Well, I think it's a bit cavalier, and now uh, you're coming from the old school, uh, the old days. I have to go along with Ian Walker again. He's not going for the code zero. He's playing it, uh, playing it cool. There's a long way to go, and he's protecting his uh, first place. Yeah, but and for Mopre, they want to prove something to their. There's no doubt they want to prove something to their 
hundreds of thousands of fans back home in Spain who are watching right now. They want to prove something to their sponsors, and they really want to prove something to their self that they are far better than the results they achieve. So, uh, hey, I like to see the big stuff up. Always put the biggest sales up whenever you can. Skippy, uh, you don't like to do that. Sorry, Skip, you don't like to do that because you're a seaman. <laughs> it's a long way to go, mate. It's a long way to go. Team SEA and Sam Davies looks to be leading the fleet, but very important to remember, all these boats are going to have to do a jibe at some point to bring them down to the next mark. And it's Alvi Medica on the inside track that still have some moves to play. They can jibe on top of other boats, try and take the breeze out of teams like SEA and overhaul them. The women looking very confident now. They've really got to be proud of themselves. They've beaten the, the boys at their own game. Sailing the boat nicely down to the bottom mark. They look like they're in good breeze here, Mark. Oh, it looks like also the breeze is actually carrying down to the next mark, which is really good news for them. As they get further out, the breeze starts to clear up. They get away from that wind shadow, and uh, they're really going to be able to consolidate. And as the breeze, you know, as the windward boat, as the breeze picks up, they, they have the ability to put the bow down and soak down, take a bit of pressure out of that. Uh, about about that uh, code zero and uh, really keep it safe to get around the next a mark. A potential lead change at the moment as Mafre struggled at that mark and let the fleet uh, get back into their own water. But now looking a little bit more confident, got the sails up and pulling, a little bit slower than Team SEA out the side, but a potential lead change. Of course, the only thing that really matters, who is leading around the next mark. Still some tactical moves to be had. Mafre though, they've got that sail up, it's pulling, the boat's sailing well. Ike Martinez, he's going to have a smile on his face, or at least he's going to feel a little bit of pressure coming off his shoulders, Mark. Well, it's always nice to lead, uh, lead at the leaving mark. It's a little, it's a little uh, psychological pat on the back to say, yeah, you've done that uh, uh, pre-race well, and you are leading the pack to the next finish line. And of course, uh, on board uh, Mafre, they've uh, made some big changes on their... Uh, on their crew list, they pulled in uh, Jean-Luc uh, Nelias. He was doing their shore weather for them, already part of the team. Instead, they brought him on board now. He's going to be navigator. And the other person they brought in, uh, Rob Greenhouse, a very uh, accomplished uh, British sailor, who I believe you know, Mark. Well, Rob uh, has come through the, uh, he's come through the skiff world. He's uh, used to sail laser 5000s, and then uh, he's now known for his moth sailing and uh you know loves loves his moth sailing and uh he's now obviously he's he's done uh, three volvo ocean races before so the fleet now heading out there's uh, the clock is ticking down to the point where they're gonna have to jibe and start sailing their way back on a more direct route to the next mark the last mark before leaving table bay there we can see from the overhead virtual eye they're not quite at the halfway point but when they get near that halfway point that's going to be the point that the fleet are gonna jive over and start heading down to the bottom. Team Brunel, Team SCA and Mafre all up vying for the lead. So let's just try and focus now on Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing. This team have been, uh, they were behind right from the start. They pulled their way back in. I'd almost expect a little bit more aggression from these sailors, Mark. I mean, they're playing a very conservative game at the moment. I would say they're playing the long game. They've got to get round this leaving mark, and then they know the conditions they're going to be out into. They've looked; they've got a pretty tidy reef in that main, and uh, that's where they're probably going to try to get uh, this lead back, uh, knowing that they don't have to put the the reef uh, in. It, uh, it's a debate whether they're going to have to shake that out, but uh, I'm pretty sure they're going to to uh, to run this uh, sail configuration because it's going to go on the nose and um, going to get windier and they're going to be sailing upwind in some pretty uncomfortable conditions. So very different uh, different decisions on board the boat. Some really wanting to push hard on these early stages. Some wanting to take in conservative. Now we can see Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing going for the jibe. We've had one or two, but Team Brunel have also just jibed in front of them. Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing now jibing to follow. Very controlled, a very different picture than what we were seeing at Mark II earlier on in the race. The breeze a little bit down. Now on board uh, Abu Dhabi as a special guest, we've got uh, Francois Pina, the uh, famous South African rugby player, on board the boat and as the uh, team round the leaving mark and just before they head out to Table Bay, it's uh, gonna be Francois, uh, his responsibility to jump off the back of the boat and a rib will pick him up. So he's gonna enjoy the ride for as long as possible, but uh, not gonna be sailing with the boat out into the Southern Ocean, that's for sure. There he is at the back there, just hanging on, just uh, 
probably looking at those uh, coffee grinders and thinking, yeah, I could give that one a pretty uh, pretty good go. A lot of these uh, sailors that we've got on board these kind of boats these these years, Mark, they're big guys, aren't they? They've got a lot of power. Well, I'm certainly you don't uh, take many small guys. It's it, it, the, the boat they're they're so underworked. You know, they've got eight people, and and you can see how much power there is on board. Um, so it really is. These guys are in, have been in the gym for many months to get to this point. So Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing, not at the front of the fleet at the moment. The two leaders, Team Brunel and Team SCA. Both teams have jived. You can see that now at the bottom of your screen, that's the next mark of the course, the leaving mark, the last mark before leaving Cape Town. Team SCA were doing such a good job out in front. Did they leave that jive a little bit too late? I wonder, Alan, if we can ask you, we've got Brunel coming in, Team SCA coming in. Which one looks better? Uh, it's a it's a good question, um, and I, I got to tell you, I hate to say it because I'm such a big fan of the, of, of the SCA team, but uh, looks like Bauer has done a really beautiful job of, of picking a ley line. He may be a little bit above the ley line, but um, but he picked a good one, and it looks like uh, it looks like Libby Greenhouse calling tactics on Team SCA probably did hold it a little bit long, but again, they have. Um, uh, we'll see. I, you know, it's it's still shifty out here, and, and as Skip keeps pointing out, it's not just Table Mountain. As you, if you can see behind the screen here, you've got gigantic mountain ranges that go on for hundreds of miles, and in effect, this entire part of the coast for I don't know how far away. But Skip, Skip, how far away is the uh, does the, the the effect of all these mountains uh, extend? Uh, very, very, yeah, very very hard to say, but uh, yeah, 10, 20 miles offshore, you can get some effect. Um, yeah. But I think, you know, if you look at uh, SCA, I think they went a bit far. You know, the other guys have played the middle of the course, and I think they sort of lost out, lost out there. They're a bit overstanding there. Yeah, no, I, I, definitely, I definitely agree with you. And, and it, looks like, uh, it looks like SCA is just going slower and slower. It's almost like they found another little pocket without wind, while Brunel is now in super soak mode, so sailing extremely deep. And I'm shocked that they can get as far, uh, as deep as they can, um, compared to Mafra, you would expect Mafra, and for a while it was holding when they were still on Port Jive or on Starboard Jive, but you would expect uh, Mafra with the big masthead zero to be able to sail five to ten degrees lower uh, toward us than Brunel, but it's not happening right now. And Bala Becking doing a masterful job of uh, getting down here to the mark. Team Brunel closing down on the leeward mark. SCA just behind them, hoping that they didn't give away too much on that late jive, or potentially picking in the right line. We've seen this breeze coming up, going down. It could be that the breeze softens as they get down to the bottom. Team Brunel have to soak and go slow, and the women can just put the bow up a little bit and come into that mark with good pace. We can see the, uh, the bow moving forward on board Team SEA. Big work on board to get those sails under control. It's, uh, it's a huge effort. The women's boat here get to sail with 11 crew members on board. The men team get to sail with eight. So just a little factor there to try and equalize the weight. But if you talk to any of the sailors in this fleet, they all say all these boats are under crewed. They'd love some more hands and some more help. Well, the first thing they're going to have to do is get rid of that sail on on uh, on the bow and actually get get configured, configured for going upwind. Um, and here we go. It's happening already on Brunel. So Brunel approached the leeward mark. Team SCA just to the side of them. Both boats have been in locked into a tight battle to this last mark. Sam Davies and her team making a fantastic effort at the last boy to really bring themselves up to the front, but Brunel just slipping past them on this downwind leg. And look at the effort that uh, the bow crew have got to do. They've got to snake it down and then, and then they're going to have to pull that to the windward side and start working on the stack. You'll see as they go around this uh, last mark, they'll start loading the boat up onto port to make that long uh, tack up wind now. They're coming into good conditions, and I think it has really been the the, uh, the breeze inside that's managed to get Brunel down inside SCA. Team Brunel leave the Table Bay and lead the fleet out into the Southern Ocean and on to Leg Two. And look at this—they've got to get the main in, and uh, Andrew Kate there coming to help, getting the uh, just two people on those pedestals. It may look like difficult sailing, and it certainly is when you've only got two people spare. Everybody else doing something else. Here comes Mapri coming down, looking pretty happy, starting to move sails up to the top side, and the fleet really is now barreling in. It's still pretty close. Uh, you know, when we talk about position two, three, four, the, the 
fleet are still pretty tight. Team Brunel, Val Beck have done a fantastic job of getting a little bit of separation between him and any of the other boats. Just going to be able to breathe a little sigh. Mafri now coming in inside of Team SCA. So, Alan, you were talking about Team SCA being a little bit wider that ley line, and Mafri now being able to take the inside route. Yeah, so they lost two boats on that move, and it's super tough because you sort of expect it to stay breezy out there, but uh, again, you know, you, can, you can't forget that it's not just Table Mountain. Uh, there are other mountains, and, and it's clear that, that, uh, that, that Team SCA didn't realize how far that hole extended. Uh, it's a shame, but still a very respectable exit. I think Mafre will be really happy with leaving in second place. Obviously, they wanted to get first, but that was a bold move. It looks like they didn't actually break the baton, uh, so it doesn't look like there's any, any major issues on the boat. And uh, I think everyone will be feeling good on board. You know, I, I, I wonder maybe now it's a good time as we, as we start to get into chase mode here. Um, but Skip, you know, you've left into the teeth of a lot of storms. And I really want to know mentally and physically how you prepare yourself and your crew to go into potentially 50 plus knots of wind in the forecast. Well, one thing you don't do is you don't start it with a hangover like we used to do in the old days. But uh, yeah, it's quite a, you know, I have to say again, uh, to start out late in the afternoon like this with a strong southeaster blowing, long way to go. It's uh, quite a daunting prospect, I must say, and uh, they're going to have a wild ride out there. Once they're going to have a little bit of wind shadow as they come around Green Point, then it's going to hit them again. Wind coming down from the 12 Apostles, the other side of Table Mountain. So they're going to have a good old thrash out there. Yeah, and you know, we talked, uh, I know all of us have been walking the docks the whole week, but you know, I had a long talk with a, with a few of the skippers today. Um, you know, I talked to Nicholson at length uh, about their, their move this first night, and, and really, you, you, the, the tack you see them on, this port tack, they're really going to head this way for quite a long while, um, potentially maybe even, you know, sort of 50 or 100 miles, and uh, waiting for this, uh, this clockwise wind shift and when they can tack and then be able to go around, uh, you know, uh, up, up, uh, be able to tack back and be able to head in the direction they need to go. Um, ideally, you know, they want to get south as fast as they can and then tack in the right spot so they can turn and head west and go as fast as they possibly can and then get over the Agulhas current as quickly as possible. Team Brunel still comfortably in the lead, 450 meters behind them, Mafri and Team SEA chasing down. At the back at the moment, Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing. Now, it almost looked like Ian Walker was sort of happy to let it happen, Mark. He, he really wasn't pushing himself on that downwind leg. Well, we've uh, seen far more aggressive sailing uh, uh, in imports and uh, race starts to date, and he certainly feels pretty happy. Uh, he's, he's sailed with uh, less sail area than the other teams, and we're seeing that. I know that we had a restart at the previous mark where he could have actually opened up, but he just seems pretty happy to play the long game, get around this, this next mark, and then uh, really, really start to concentrate on taking the lead back if, if he can do that. I mean, in fact, when you look, we just saw on that close-up shot, the, the, the sailors on board, they almost didn't look flustered at all. They, they obviously have a plan. They're very confident with it. Chris Nicholson and uh, Team Vestas win. Now they approach that leeward mark, that last mark, before heading out to the Southern Ocean. These guys get fourth on the last leg, but this team have got a lot to give. When you talk to the sailors around the dock, one thing that they all say is any, any one of these teams could win at this point. Every single team has the potential to do it. So Franz Harpin are on board that boat's got to be ready to be jumping off. In fact, one of the crew members just helping with some of his possessions, putting them in a water, waterproof bag. Uh, Mark, have you ever jumped off the back of a, a boat like this, going at this kind of speed? I, I certainly haven't. I'm not sure if I would want to do that. So that was interesting. That was Matt uh, Knightland, Knighton that uh, the uh, OBR there just getting uh, the uh, putting actually some of his uh, film and footage from the start in that bag to give it to Francois. And uh, so it means that the media department can then start uh, making movies straight away. And I want to come to the uh, OBRs and how important it is, the onboard reporters, a little later. Uh, but uh, now you can see, and there's Ian Walker just turning around. So you ready, mate? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that Francois is probably Francois is probably a little bit hesitant at this point because the sea's pretty rough. They're back into that big breeze, and uh, when those boats heel over, it's a long way down onto the water. So uh, it's going to have to. It's going to get your heart rate going. I mean, I know this is probably one of the toughest individuals on the planet but uh, jumping off a boat like this if you're not used to it is going to take a little bit of courage and I can honestly tell you that the water is pretty cold as well but the team what they're going to do now is they're just getting uh, the boat set getting the boat balanced getting the sail configuration right Ian Walker just looking up to make sure that the support rib was coming in because no one's getting off the boat until that's in place 
and uh, as I said you can see there just top right a picture there the first sail that comes up on deck and uh, the trimmer's still working hard on boat speed Ian Walker in his, in his uh, uh, familiar hunt style there just uh, um, just pushing the keel up you can see his left hand just hitting the hydraulics just moving the keel up a little bit and here comes the famous stack the crew come forward and they start moving all the spare sails up to that windward side up to the high side to give them more stability and to start to give them some writing moment to bring on the boat speed now that they've reduced all those those crew maneuvers so justin slattery and the sailors there loading the sails up to the high side Let's just have a look at the overall picture. Team Brunel, Bauer Becking just flying away at the head of the fleet. Fantastic speed, just trying to eke out every meter he can. He knows how important this first 24 hours is going to be. Behind him, Maffrey, Team SEA and Team Alvi Medica, very much in a bunch, all fighting it out for that chasing place. Then behind them, Dong Fong race team, Team Vestas win, bringing up the rear, but surprisingly, they're looking confident. Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing. I wouldn't be surprised to uh, to hear that uh, Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing have one or two tricks up their sleeve for this leg. This team has done so much preparation for the race. And in fact, I was having a, a, a chat with one of the shore team managers of, the, of uh, Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing. He was saying on the import, he was saying if we needed to go offshore today, the only difference we make is we just pack more food. We've done all the weather, we've done all the boat work, everything is ready to go. This, these sailors feel very, very confident. So the next 48 hours for that team will be very interesting. There's going to be some big plays to be made. There we can see the boat really healing over. We've said it before, they really like to sail on their side, don't they? They really do get powered up. Now, keeping the boat flat, Mark, we've got these uh, swinging keel underneath. Just to have a little... Talk us through how that keel works. For some people that might be watching, not too used to a swinging keel, this thing can swing 40 degrees either way. Well, it's moved up with hydraulics and uh, it adds the writing moment. And their boats are a little bit more tender. Everyone that comes onto the boats that have been used to the 70s in the past, they all say that the, uh, it's far more, uh, uh, the action of the boat is, is, is a lot more rapid. It, it seems to uh, jerk and slam as it goes upwind. And uh, we've, had, we've actually had on Vestas in the last leg, they broke two laptops just by the, the action of the slamming on board. The laptops were bolted down or were strapped down to the, the navigation desk and the screens actually broke just from the action of the boat. And it just imagine what it's like living on the boats, trying to sleep on the boats. And certainly I remember, here goes the guys pushing the stack up there. And uh, so now let's you have can a look, see little look at that overall. It's amazing to see how much of a almost a follow the leader race it was up until that downwind leg to that last mark where we did see so much place changing. Team SCA did a fantastic move and uh, and they lost on there. So, uh, Alan, how does it look on the water now? We're now into that chase sequence out. How do the boats look? Um, I, they look really fast and they look really wet and they look really uncomfortable at the moment. Um, and and uh, I tell you, you know, I, I think I'm I'm really interested when I get when I get back and go and see the differences in boat speed between them because the, the the level of heel in, in uh, between the boats is very different. And part of that's um part of that's puffs and, and lulls, but part of it is just the way they're sailing the boat. Um, and uh, and I'm really interested in which way is working the best. I think the sailors would be too. So, um, but I think uh, you know I, the question. Well, Alan, I was just wondering if, if you could uh, if you could ask Skip a quick question for us. I mean, we're wondering just uh, have these boats navigated safely around the wind shadow? Is this the breeze that's going to carry them out into the Southern Ocean? That's a great question, Skip. Uh, and I suspect it'll, it should soften. Uh, you know, and not too far ahead there, just around Greenpoint, there is another wind shadow to come up usually, but they may be they may be far enough out to carry on around. But then they'll get a lot more wind as they come into the Camp Bay side between Camp Bay and Alpha. It should be very breezy. And one more quick thing, Skip, obviously you being a, a local sailor and, you know, years of experience as well. I, in fact, actually, I, I might just come back to you because we're getting uh, very, very close to uh, the jumper coming off uh, Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing. Uh, Francois Pina, the uh, South African rugby player, in fact, there he goes, giving the uh, crew a thumbs up, makes his way down to the bottom of the boat. This is uh, going to be quite a, an interesting jump at this speed. And he's got his uh, grab bag there with the media coming off the boat. We're going to see that uh, some live shots, uh, well, some recorded shots a little later when that comes to us. 
And I wonder goes. how something like this compares to uh, being, in, a, last being race, in a rugby game. There were points for how, how well the jumpers did, whether they did somersaults or straight off. Here we go. Don't break anything, mate. Go on, go. go on, give it a good one. We've got one shot at this. Oh, he's a little bit hesitant. It's a little, it's, it, the boat this looks flat, but it is bucking around there. It's difficult to hold on to, and you, you want to be able to get clean away from it. You don't want to get your foot snagged in anything. Here we go. There we go. Oh, a little bit of a slip there at the end, but he managed to come off quite well. He's in the water. He's happy. The life jacket inflates. There he is. He's a happy man. The only problem is, like you said, Mark, that water will be very, very cold. He's done well. And what an experience for him to, to, uh, to be on board for the race start. And here comes the chase rib to bring him up. A really, a really nice send off for Ian Walker and his guys to have somebody like that on board. Such a fantastic sportsman to give him a little pat on the back and send them on their way. There he goes into the support rib. And on Alba Medica, they had a, uh, someone jumping who actually uh, bid for the, uh, the place. Yeah, Alba that Medica, went to charity. Alba Medica has been doing a... Uh, campaign where on all of the ports Alvin Medica has been uh, uh, renting out their um, renting out their jump seat now team Brunel out in front looking very very comfortable out in front the sun is starting to come down uh, uh, it, the interesting thing is going to be what happens tonight as the sun goes down Alan I was wondering if I could uh, if I could ask you guys a quick question we've been hearing a lot about the sea state that we're going to be hitting over the next 24 hours and of course as darkness comes in the sea is meant to be getting rougher um, I, you know it, it, uh, it is but you know we're, we're sheltered for a little while I think there's sort of about 15 or some odd miles where we're still behind the land a little bit and then once we get out into it, it's going to get a lot worse. But let's let's see what Skip thinks, because this is his playground. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, the furthest we get offshore, there's going to be more sea. Uh, that's clear. Uh, but as they harden up into it, you know, there's the thing about not going too far inshore as well. That critical tack uh, tomorrow morning or tomorrow is going to be, uh, that's going to tell all. That, that's where you're going to see tactics split. Guys wanting to go further south quicker and other guys trying to cut the corner. So. That's all. That's going to be very interesting. And there has been Nile. There has been. Uh, uh, there have been Cape Town starts that it was so rough that that the uh, boats that left Table Bay and just kind of hung out behind the mountains for the night did better than the boats that went out to sea and broke people uh, and bits and pieces. Um, but but Nile, I just want to. Yep. I just wanted to take you back to this. Uh, this about the uh, uh, the guys jumping off the boat. You know, I, I got a chance to do it too. Um, and it's a pretty fun thing to do, but I don't know about doing it here. And, and the reason is, is because if you walk up and down the pier and this beautiful race village at Victoria, uh, Victoria Wharf, everyone is selling tickets to go see the sharks, the great white sharks that they chum for. And it's pretty close to here. So let's ask Sean from Hooked on Africa, our driver here today. Um, what's the deal with the sharks? And would you want to jump off into this water? Yeah, we do have quite a few great whites swimming around the bay here. Um, two popular dive destinations in Cape Town, False Bay, which the guys will be heading around Cape Point later. So yeah, there's a lot of uh, fish here with some big teeth. Not sure is, about is, is there any real danger? No, not really. No, nah, not really. It's uh, unfortunately sort of dramatized and put through Hollywood to make it look way worse than it is. Well, it helps bring the tourists in as well, but uh, you, <laughs> you know, um, I still don't know that I'd want to do it, guys. Um, but it's fun being out here. We're in right now. Um, we're in, we're still in the lee of the land, but already just about a mile and a half offshore. Um, we've got, uh, I'll call it three to five foot seas um, and, and pretty nice though. I mean, this is nice sailing conditions. Alan, and I'm just going to have to come in there because yeah. what we're seeing at the moment, Team Brunel has, they look like they've just parked up in front. Mafre electing to go over the top of them to windward, still up at around 14 knots, but Brunel down to about six knots. And I think we're just seeing it, maybe a big hole on the water. Well, it's certainly uh, now taking some advantage of uh, some great pressure coming down and also realizing that they're still not into consistent pressure. There are big holes in the pressure and uh, certainly shifting conditions. And you can see now that SCA going up right here. You can see exactly how, how light it's gone for them now. And, th and this is what we're going to see, I think, a long way along this coast. I mean, we're talking about 15, 20 miles where the breeze will be uh, up and down as it comes through the, the valleys or it ex accelerates along the headlands. 
Um, so I think we might see some real place changing in the next hour or so. Well, let's see how this one plays out because I was talking to uh, Bauer Becking from Team Brunel earlier and he was saying one of the changes that they made from leg one to leg two is a little bit of a change with the watch system. Now, these boats are flying along, you know, Dong Fong in front here. They're just absolutely creaming along, all hands on deck to keep this boat under control. But of course, you've got to start switching into your watch system. So when do you make that move? Well, it's still very, very intense racing, and, and, and as you can see there's sail changes to be made. They've got the stack going, the breeze is up and down, and so I don't think that anyone's going to be going to a watch system for a while. And, uh, you know, in fact, I think it's going to help because I hated that first night's sleep because you kind of weren't tired enough, and you sat in your bank bunk, and, and it, was, it was breezy, and you couldn't really sleep, and uh, you, need, you need to have a, a really good hard night in order for then for you to rest into it and actually get in your, your bunk and then fall straight to sleep. So I think you know, these, these guys are going to be working really, really hard all the way through this coast. Alan, I was wondering if you could just pin Skip down for me with uh, his opinion. I know he's going to try and dodge this one a little bit, but what does he expect to see these boats do? Are they going to be hugging the shore over the next 24 hours or what's going to be the move? Well, uh, generally, if you talk to the locals, uh, you know, racing along this shore is not the thing to do, not the thing to hug the shore. You want to be, uh, you want to be out. But certainly, that's the case as you move farther east around uh, Agullis. You want to get out of that current and out of the land effect and uh, offshore, looking for those uh, that southwest shift. Definitely. So, yeah, that's the. Uh, you know, you want to be uh, well, well aware there are too many holes in shore. And you've also got the pitfall of there's a lot of uh, weed or, or um, kelp. Uh, there's kelp fields in, in, in there, I can remember, going past this area. And uh, certainly they don't want any of that around the keel. Um, so that's another reason to, uh, to, to keep off the coast and just uh, sail in that slightly more consistent pressure. That's right. Uh, but it's a funny thing. I checked the wind today, late afternoon, and uh, on, a, on a wind... Uh, wind unit down at uh, Cape Point and it was blowing northerly 18 so there are a lot of anomalies around that you could take advantage of if you did if you did take that risk. Well and as you say that Skip you're looking like a real guru because these boats are just starting to stand up they've just sailed out of the breeze dead serious I'm looking at them they're standing up uh, that they're probably doing seven or eight knots and um, I just just like that everything has changed um, we tried to get some kelp for you to show you what it looked like but it's a little rough out here the kelp is not like little stringers of kelp you might be familiar with in some of your places, or even the long stuff in San Diego. The kelp is as thick around as, um, as a girl's wrist, and it is almost impossible to cut, and uh, yeah, it's amazing stuff. So um, that's one thing that these guys are actually very, very worried about, because if they hit it, uh, it might mean they have to back the boat down, actually go in reverse using the sails. You can't turn the engine on, obviously, but go back down until the kelp comes off. That's gonna cost a lot of time. Another big difference in these boats um, from boat to boat you guys were talking about the watch system uh, I talked to three different boats this morning three completely different watch system two twos three threes four fours um, and that's another difference it's it and, and that's based on the personality of the skipper another difference from these guys um, as we start to figure out who's gonna prevail here is where they want to cross the Agulhas current okay um, I talked to Albumetica for instance and where they were targeting was where it was about 55 to 60 miles wide. I talked to Vestas and they were looking at a 35 mile wide, uh, wide Agulhas current. And I guess Skip, um, if we've got the time, can you explain why that current is so important to navigate correctly and what effect it has on the sea state? Well, I mean, uh, you know, the Agulhas current, you could have three to four, even five knots sometimes uh, running west for a start. And uh, this very wide band between uh, East London and, um, and uh, Port Elizabeth and Durban areas, you want to stay well away from that. So the, you know, the temptation, of course, is to cut the corner going northeast. But I think, the, you know, I think you'll see the smart money going, uh, st staying deeper south, cutting the corner later and rounding up uh, in good shape. You want to be you well, well away. Skip, I'm just going to have to interrupt you there because we're seeing some rather decisive moves out in the water. Team Vestas Wind have elected to go on a very high track and they've still got the speed. They're up at around 19 knots. And in fact, they've got their bowman out on the front, rigging what looks like their code zero. Down at the bottom of the course, Team Brunel, who were, who were comfortably in the lead, parked up. They're now at about 12 knots. Uh, two minutes ago, they were down at five. Mafre just underneath them, struggling to move as well. So another huge park up, swallowing up Bal Becking and Team Brunel, and really spat them down at, out the back. Of it. The the uh, the tracker really showing how uh, how split this fleet is. 
Some of the teams going high, Team Vestas and Chris Nicholson leading that charge, some of the teams going low. So already, and there's the picture, already we have a huge tactical decision. There goes Ian Walker and Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing to the right of the screen. Chris Nicholson and Vestas Wind on the left. You can see out in the distance the, uh, the bottom of Cape Hope, and then it's round to the left. Skip, we're seeing a big decision coming out in the water. Which one do you prefer, going high or low? Uh, for me, I'd have to say go low. Off the coast, as I said before, I think it's the thing to do, and that's where the, you talk to all the local sailors here. They, they stay they still well away, well away. And, and remember, uh, remember now, Nico, uh, Nico's done this race four odd times, and um, he sailed around here a few times. And I think, you know, that that old school idea before we headed north after this leg up into into the Arabian Gulf, that old school idea of get down into the train, get out down into where you get some westerly action, and ride toward Cape Horn for you for a day or two at least, get your westing, and then make your turn and head up north. That's that way. That's what we're going to see from a lot of these boats. And um, I, I'd, I'd say it's even money or maybe a little bit better on, that, on, on what Skip's saying to do. Head well, out on port and, uh, and get into the train. Well, Alvi Medica, Charlie Enright and his uh, team of young gun sailors, they've just sailed their way into a big hole. They were out in the lead. They're looking great. And now with that sort of that motion header, the jib just tacking on, on, on board the boat there, they're just into a velocity header, the breeze coming straight from the bow. So they're sailing so faster they than do. the breeze they're in, so that's, that's why we're seeing that sail back onto the, onto the fore deck. They're really having to be reactionary here. Oh, and Team SCA now trying to close in, but the problem is, will they sail into the same hole? Out on the top to the windward edge, it's still Chris Nicholson and Team Vestas. Their speed's down a little bit, but it hasn't really dropped to the low numbers. Maybe we're going to see Chris Nicholson rolling the dice and just simply going over the top of all the boats. Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing still out to the bottom. This could have been the move that was giving them smiles in their faces out the back. Maybe they had a trick. Alvi Medica now completely parked up with that jib backed. Team SCA just, well, I would say just to windward, but there isn't any wind. Just right next to them, their jib also backed. Chris Nicholson out on top. You can see from that image, just around the top of your screen, the darker edge of water. That's where the breeze is. But right where these two boats are sat, the water's looking a little bit lighter, a little bit glassy. They're just going to have to wait for the next puff. Cape Town just doesn't want to let them go. It really it doesn't. And it just, it is interesting here, you know, uh, Ian Walker on board at Abu Dhabi, they were last round the leaving mark, and they chose a very decisive run to, to, to stay out, like, uh, you know, Skip Novak uh, backs that option. And you can see the breeze is still consistent out uh, out towards the, out to, uh, off coast. And look at this, they're even now on starboard, just trying to keep the boats moving. We've had a total change of wind there. They've tacked without actually turning the wheel. And uh, Team Vestas wind coming down from the top of your picture is still on that old breeze. So some of these boats are in for surprise. One's going to win and lose. So it wouldn't surprise me if that option of uh, going offshore and keeping well out, because uh, this is a pretty big right-hand shift now. And who's on the right-hand side? Abu Dhabi. And uh, it's, it is also interesting that, that Vestas was the boat that rounded just ahead of Ian Walker and they chose uh, from the back of the fleet to split round either side. And Vestas now try to come down and uh, try to make it make the most. I think Vestas might be back in it. If the breeze comes back in, they can bear down and bring the pressure down and try to sail over the fleet. But if it doesn't come out, come round, doing five something knots, uh, Abu Dhabi out to sea and Dong Fong. And again, you know, the, 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 this light spot has, has extended all the way out. So Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing still with just a little bit of momentum. We're going from 20 knots plus to almost zero breeze and just a snap of your fingers. Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing electing to go offshore, trying to sail round the wind shadow. Next to them, Dong Fong, close into the shore. Team Vestas Wind and Chris Nicholson. But it's Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing potentially with a very nice move. And in fact, just as the camera panned round there, Potentially, we just saw a little bit of a puff coming only a couple of hundred meters in front of them. Can they get to it? Well, it'd be interesting to see at this point whether they actually put someone up the rig to try to. I know they're very short staffed here, um, but they look, there goes uh, Justin Slattery on the bow, and uh, it looks like they're rigging the code zero. And there comes the Halyard coming forth, coming forward, and uh, Ian Walker looking around. Pen 
apprehensively looking for where the next pressure is coming and you can see the uh, uh, the flag on the back of the boat there just showing the breeze going a little bit forward for them bow coming down you can see their course has gone right and they're going to try to get some pressure out there on uh, offshore well let's just take a few moments to look at the course that they're going to be doing after leaving this bay because of course we're talking about the next few minutes but this is a race that's going to be raced over many many days so let's just have a little bit of a little bit of a, a look at the uh, the course for this leg where the fleet's going to be taken and how it's going to be shaping up for the next 48 hours and beyond obviously the first thing is they've got to get through that wind shadow just round table bay then the fleet can clear cape horn slog their way out to the bottom of south africa round through these opposing currents at the southeastern end of Africa, over the top of Madagascar, avoiding the exclusion zones near the island of Mauritius. Then it's back across the equator into the Arabian Sea, squeeze their way through the Straits of Hormuz and a short dash south to Abu Dhabi, where warm weather will be waiting for them. So we've spoken a lot about the next 48 hours, but of course, 20 to maybe 30 days of racing are awaiting them there what a fantastic shot there you can see what, what the challenge for these boats breeze on the course in areas and a total hole in the wind in others mafre leaving your picture on the right they look like they found a little bit of pressure shaking out that reef and they've got the code zero up team brunel that were looking so strong now in the middle they're parked up, but above them, it looks to me like Team SCA have found a fantastic bit of breeze and they are off looking very, very confident. So Mark, talk us through, how does the weather, how's the weather gonna shape up over the next 48 hours? Well, this, uh, you can see the breeze is still very, very light and shifty and uh, changeable as we come down to Cape Town and we can see that they've got to get past, they're gonna go upwind tonight and the breeze will be back up around the Cape of Good Hope and they come back out here. Now this is really interesting. Look at the arrows here as they you have a right hand shift on port and uh, depending on how far you go out you're going to try to get to east. The reason you want to get east is look at this conditions bottom right of screen. That is going to that, that is the breeze that's going to uh, flood you out round through the bottom of Mad uh, Madagascar and then up towards the tropics. So very interesting 48 hours. The first big test for these sailors have already started simply navigating this tricky, patchy breeze that we have here. Now the, the teams, of course, they're going to be having a, a continuing battle for the next few moments. So I'm just wondering, uh, Skip, if I can just uh, come to you in the last few minutes that we've got. I mean, when are you gonna start putting these sailors to bed? If you are a skipper of these boats, when do you go into your watch system? Well, I think, you know, they're going to be going for it for a while until things settle down and they get some steady breeze. And they're going to have, I would imagine, all hands on deck for the next couple hours until, uh, until they get some true wind. And then they'll go into the watch system for sure, yeah. You so, know, and, oh, sorry. Just, no, no, sorry, Alan, I was just going to say, I mean, we're just seeing Team Brunel at the moment. They've just had an enormous wind shift, almost blow them over. Just as I just as I brought you in, almost blow them completely over. And now as we look at them again, the breeze is just is just They're just died. waiting for this puff to hit three two one that's what they've been calling on board here comes the pressure now you can see the darker patches come down they stayed on this run this this leg and here we go here comes the speed the main starts to come on the sail tries to tri uh, trim and off they go and these are the conditions that they're going in here it really is it's going to be very very demanding uh it's sail changing constantly trimming main in main out and uh, I am amazed at these, uh, these conditions around these corners. It's going to create some incredible sailing tonight. Very intense. And I, for sure, when we come out for these live images, I can't wait to get to the tracker. I think the next 48 hours, or indeed the next 24 hours, are really going to be interesting in this race. We've got a major tactical decision about whether you try and chase the breeze offshore or whether you roll the dice close inshore. Now, as you were talking about that breeze coming up and down, it's so important to remember, if these boats were offshore and this breeze was staying, on the lulls, they'd have one configuration of sails. On the gusts, they'd have another. They don't have that option when the breeze is coming in this quickly. They simply have to trim their way round it. Immense pressure and immense concentration needed from the trimmers. And I'm just thinking, if I was a trimmer on board, I can see these, this puff coming. I can hear it coming. 
and I can react to it because it's daylight. What's happening? The sun is setting. In, in uh, less than a, in, a, in, a, in an hour, it'll start to get dark and it'll de- get harder and harder to actually uh, um, be reactionary with these pressures. And uh, you know, you can you'll, you'll be using your ears almost more than you can see see the see the pressures. Oh, so uh, I was wondering, Alan, if I could just bring Skip in one more time. The, the images that we're seeing, Team SEA on top, slightly close to the shore, going over the top of the fleet. I was wondering if Skip still feels like Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing out to sea, still going to be able to get back into this game? Well, I think what's happened is, is usually when you're a pundit, it all goes wrong for you, doesn't it? Uh, what happened there is they managed to sort of sneak their way through that wind shadow and get into the breeze coming down off uh, Camps Bay off the 12 Apostles. So they managed to pull that off. You know, it could have went where they got stuck for a longer period of time and the guys offshore would have would have uh, capitalized on that. But there you go. That's, well, that's yacht racing. That's yacht racing for you. That is definitely yacht racing. What you don't maybe see, Niall, um, is, is we've been tracking. You know, it's a little hard to see exactly what, what they're all doing, but we've been tracking Vestas um, and the boats in the middle on the AIS system that we've got on board here. And Vestas, uh, where, you know, you guys saw him go up against the shore and, and sort of disappear, and he's separated by quite a bit from the fleet. According to the AIS right now, he's doing 14.7 knots, is Chris Nicholson, while the rest of the fleet is doing from 5 to 9. So it seems like, uh, Mark, maybe he found some kind of a compression um, closer to the shore or, or, or maybe the wind coming around the other side of the, of the mountains. Um, but whatever he's done, he's, he's locked into something good. Whether it holds or not is another issue. Well, there's certainly big puffs, and we've seen the conditions coming out uh, from the shore. And if he can hook up to a puffer and actually sail and roll over the fleet, they're going to be really looking well. Sophie Zizek, the bow woman on board, uh, Team SEA, just grappling with a sail change. And, of course, the next 48 hours is going to be crucial. Probably the best way that you can keep in touch with the race and keep in touch with all the drama and all the action out on the water is to download the Volvo Ocean Race app. It's the easiest way to stay in touch with everything happening in the race. Download the app. All the drama and the racing news can be found in one place. Keep up with all the action 24-7. So, Mark, final thoughts from you and a fantastic uh, little bit of action we've had there. Just before that, sorry, uh, Alan, if I could just come to you. You're you're out there on the water. Final thoughts? Thanks. Now, um, you know, I, uh, I I went over to the Volvo Ocean Race Village, and uh, it's, I'm talking to, to the the many, many hundreds and thousands or millions of you that will be coming to one of these stopovers or many of them. Um, it's it's an unbelievable sight. But but I, I sat down in this um, in this cinema that they have, and they play a movie um, about 25 minutes long or so about the history of this race and and some of the people that have made it and the people that have lost their lives in it. And I kind of want us all to remember for just a minute. Um, that as much fun as it is with, with these very pretty candy-colored boats and their and their great speeds and great sponsors and fun people, um, this is this is life and death stuff. Okay, and um, it's life and death stuff, and we all just got to keep in mind that this can 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 end your life. And so let's just all have a thought that they stay safe tonight. So thanks for having us for for me and Skip. Back up to you, Niall. Thanks very much for that, Alan. Mark. Yeah, how did you view the action today? Well, I mean, Cape Town, it's, it's, uh, it's the place of highs and lows, lulls and wind. And exactly uh, like we saw on the leg finish of leg one, we saw the race won and lost there. And uh, we saw it again at the start of leg two, the differences in conditions. And it's going to be a very tricky night for them tonight. There are going to be lots and lots of place changing, I am sure. And then they're going to be getting off the land and into their ocean racing. Well, all the navigators have a slightly different idea on just when the fleet will roll into Abu Dhabi. But if the last leg was anything to go by, the race could be right up to the finish. We'll have the arrivals live on the website. So be sure to catch the battles in the last few miles as the boats arrive home. It's goodbye from me and Mark. Goodbye from Alan and Skip. Plenty of action to come for the next few days. We will see you again in Abu Dhabi.